I'm joined today by Jens Gempel, who is the founder and CEO of Sourceability. Jens, great to talk to you. Thanks for taking the time to chat to me today. Um, I wanted to open with a topic that's kind of hot at the moment for obvious reasons, but has been an issue for probably three or four years now, and that's the role of geopol geopolitics in the supply chain. Every time there's a conflict, we're, we're hearing from people, what's the impact going to be on the supply chain? How does that impact our supply chain? So what are you hearing from your customers? What are you doing to help provide that information and help mitigate some of that supply chain risk they're seeing? First of all, Philip, thanks for having me and, and giving us the time to chat a little bit about what's going on in our industry. Um, I think that geopolitical situations that we are facing right now globally is on one hand, it's a, it's a challenge um, for every supply chain from how secure, how safe is my my existing setup, yeah? which mm -hmm. brings us back to, I think, what we've learned in the last two or three years that um, companies have to create more flexibility, which means they simply have to have more knowledge and, and more data to make their decisions. And, and that's what we are facing right now. We really can see in the last two or three years, we came from a really critical shortage, a shortage like I've never seen before in the in the last 30 years to now. And it was always like this. You had a shortage and then some at a certain point the shortage fell off the glyph. Yeah. Mm. And it became and it became an, an access and inventory environment. And I think that's what we are facing right now. Um, a lot of people have more inventory than they forecasted, than they were supposed to have. Um, in addition to that, now they they have pressure maybe on the on the interest global interest rates that went up yeah. to finance this inventory, and they somehow try to find a balance. Okay, how much inventory I really have to carry, mm -hmm. and how much I can maybe find a new home for. So I think this is right now where people like to have the crystal ball and understand better what is going on on the production side from the manufacturers and what's going on with the customers. Yeah, I think there are two questions there. You know, one is the supply chain shortage, um, and we'll talk about that. And obviously, the other is is the geopolitics. And, you know, what we're seeing with particularly the EMS industry is some redesigning of supply chain. Um, so they require that visibility into when components will be available, but it's also where components will be available. So touching on the um on the on the shortages we've seen over the last 18 months. And as you say, the 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 changes seem to be very, very sudden. And maybe that's because we as an industry don't have enough um advance warning. Talk to me about how you how you see that availability if you see it improving and increasing um over the coming months but also talk to me a little bit about how we can deal with that excess inventory because i know you have some some interesting tools that allow people to you know yes. figure out what they've got in terms of value because i think a lot of people bought at crazy prices and don't know what the value of they did they did and I, and I and 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 i think this is kind of our daily bread and butter and in in sourceability that developing of digital tools that we make available to our customers and suppliers. Yeah, I think what, what happened is uh, what we have seen in, in, in coming into the shortages was that a, a lot of industries were like just in time. You know, mm. people really tried to have everything just in time. And then all of a sudden the pandemic hit, um, demand in certain areas went through the roof. And, the, and, and in other areas, people were concerned that there's no business automotive you know they mm. if two or three months dealerships were closed all of a sudden yeah. all business moved online and demand came back and i think this is where there's a change of mind i think people understand that they need a, a, a healthy uh, stock inventory buffer stock that uh, not everything can be just in time i think this is what a lot of, of our customers have learned over the last 18 months but having inventory um, you know, and in our industry, the expiration date is like the it, it's like it's two years. It's not like uh, mm -hmm. we're dealing with vegetable and fruits. But if you have inventory for nine, twelve, fifteen months, that might be a concern. And yeah. the question really is, and and that what we see right now is to figure out, yeah, what do we do with the inventory? 
is that and and incoming inventory yeah we, what we learn is there are significant investments around the world in product in in productivity in production capacity yeah so um i think the uh, uh overall our industry will grow yeah production will keep going you you mm. talk to, if you talk to our customers um, here and there we see a drop in demand, but overall it's like the, with the consumer in the US, it's pretty stable. Yeah, mm. businesses are uh, um, in the EMS environment. Yeah, if if you follow the numbers of the of the tier one EMS partners, I've seen some of the the shares skyrocketing in the in the in the in the last uh, two quarters. So it looks like overall. Um, um, it might take a little, maybe another two quarters uh, to to find out where we are with this inventory. People are not really willing to offset a lot of inventory right now. It's more like, okay, how can I carry in my inventory and in my books and my physical inventory over the next two to three quarters till I find out what the real state is with our economy. Also talking about the US and in Europe, Still talking about a potential uh, 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 um, downturn in the economy, a recession. Yeah, uh, but we are talking about a recession. I don't know. In the essence, three or four or five quarters. Yeah, and and mm. and, and the economy keeps growing. So that's hopefully hopefully a good sign for the existing inventory. But in the balance sheets, it's all public company. It hurts. So we are having tools um, where like an access estimator where people really can upload their bill of material and they can see what the value of their inventory is today compared to what they might have paid or what they would pay if they go from a regular supply chain. So there's certain factors. Obviously, the date code is always a factor. Is it manufacturing? Uh, is it traceable? Uh, uh, is it original sealed? So these things they they play a role when you when you make a judgment uh, of the valuation of your existing inventory. Yeah, and that's hugely valuable, isn't it? You know, the glass factory and this idea that digital would allow us to see in the factory and allow us to see where our jobs were. Now everybody wants to talk about the glass pipeline and the idea of this visibility in the supply chain because that's the critical part. And as you say. There's been this huge shift from just in time to just in case, and this idea of mitigating risk and this idea of perhaps creating some shorter supply chains that may be more sustainable, but maybe a little bit more like friend shoring and uh, and such. So I think those digital that suite of digital tools is exactly what the EMS industry is asking for and. I think they felt that during the last supply chain crisis, they were lacking, you know, they were lacking in those tools. Are there more tools available for them now? Is it easier for you to build a partnership with an EMS company and provide them with a set of tools that gives them that visibility? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, th I think it's all about data. Yeah. Uh, you, you try to create a transparency and and you try also what what is one of the most used words like from our customers is like is is there something predictive out there yeah and and we have a tool uh, also that like data link where we have predictive analytics on certain products on manufacturers on part number level where we mm -hmm. can see what is the inflow of inventory what is the outflow of inventory increase of lead times decrease of lead times yeah the value is it is a product that has multiple distributors or just a single distributor uh, has it cross references so that in in case you could have a second or third or fourth manufacturer designed in so what we see really is on uh, also on the EMS level is that the risk assessment became something that is on a C level now. So people really, a, a CEO, a CFO, a CIO, they all want to know really where's my risk on my on my production side. So and um, what they do is they try to integrate this data that we provide and others provide into their systems. So if it's their uh, um, ERP systems, it's if it's their PLM systems. Their design systems. We yesterday, uh, uh, um, uh, um, it it was uh, um, um, sent through the tickers. Our partnership with Cadence, yeah, which mm. is uh, Cadence now is using Data Link, our data tool, uh, inside their um, um, EDA tools, 
yeah, to inform designers at the moment when they design a board, when they design a product about possible supply chain or design in risks. Yeah, talking about life cycles, talking about cross references. So it gives the the uh, um, uh, engineer already in the design phase. Uh, a glimpse if there might be something down the street that might have impact on the supply chain, which they did not have in the in the past. And I still, I'm look, I'm a fighter for the engineers. An engineer is, should develop the best possible product. Yeah, but if the best possible product cannot be produced because of problems in the supply chain, it really doesn't help the company. Yeah. Here is it what what we try to with our products also to create is. A, more transparency from the design and up to the mass production on how healthy is your bill of material and how healthy is your design. Yeah, I think that's critical. My um, my career started designing printed circuit boards in Cambridge in the UK uh, some considerable time ago, and there was definitely no thought of supply chain risk and concerns about that. But certainly, you should be scoring a job for supply chain risk when you design it. You should be scoring that job for supply chain risk when it arrives at the uh, EMS company, um, and the, there should be an awareness of that when you're when you're pricing a project. I I would say common sense. Everyone would agree with you, but also uh, service in on, on the engineering side uh, uh, resulted in that engineers have a tendency to use products that they have used before on their boards, you know? Mm. So, and and here's now that, that, now we're talking about life cycle. If you, if you create something for three, four, five years and you're using the same parts because you're familiar with them and and and, and, and the functionality, then you might not in, in, immediately think about, okay, what's the life cycle of this product? Is it 10 years? Is it 12 years? Is it 15 years? Is there, if, is there a, a newer product? They have to check, did I ever receive a product change notification for what I'm designing? And so you can see the habits. So, And I think it's really easy now. You create a bill of material while you design, while you while you put the board together, and it, it tells you in a kind of a life mode, okay, look, this part, there is a risk because it's like mm. 12 years in the market, and usually the life cycle is 15 years. So if your yeah. product's life cycle is longer than three years, you might look for other products to design. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, just just last question as we as we wrap up here. I wanted to go back to the not to not so much geopolitics, but geography yeah. of manufacturing. Yes. There seems to be a lot of incentives to build additional component capacity, particularly in the Americas, but also in yeah. Europe and elsewhere. You know, the CHIPS Act, the European equivalent, yeah. the IRA, um, those different things. My my sense is that's very much the long game. That isn't going to have an impact in the short term. How do you see that working out, and how how long do you think that cycle will be? Yeah, you know, I, if 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 we see if we see that life repeats itself, you know, my concern is the closer the factory, the more I go back in a just in time delivery model, you know. Mm. <laughs> I, I, so yeah, the closer the factory, that the shorter the ways, you know. And 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 I think the better the relationship. So what I think is, first of all, yes, we have a Chips Act in the US and we have a Chips Act in Europe. But this is just a small portion of the capex that's also invested by the industries on more go, getting more regional instead of global, like like they did in the in the 20, 20 or, or thirty years ago. Yeah. yeah, which which I think is is good because it gives you more flexibility also to react of local demands. So I I think it, it it's not only from a perspective of 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 the economy, it's also flexibility in the supply chain. So what we know is that these factories take three, four, five years to build. So obviously we are, we are not having an impact, a huge impact from mm -hmm. this in twenty twenty four. But you know, the first uh, uh, factory started planning in 2021, 2022. So I would say in the next three to five years, we will see results, mm -hmm. which at the end of the day, and now we go back to data, I think gives more flexibility to the local production, you know? And 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 uh, back in the days, I remember uh, um, when, when companies like HP or Dell or whatever 
would uh, uh, offshore their production into, into China or Asia in, in general, mm. you know. Lead times went up, yeah, production, everything got bordered, you know. Every, uh, so if we if we have a local production and we can use trucks, we get across the, 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 the U.S. within three to five days. We get through yeah. Europe in three to five days. So it might also help the, the supply chain, the planning, yeah. The question really is of if the tools... If, if if at a certain point, if, if we look from three years, five years from now, can we have all the data that we have in design, that we have in supply chain, that we have in production? Uh, can we all have this data in one system on the on the customer side? That's I think that is the number one question. And I think that's where we're going, that at a certain point, we have centralized data, we put mm. intelligence over it, artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And we predict, I think we, and we become more predictable in, in especially uh, um, in, 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 with this data. Yeah, no, it's, it's huge, Jens. And if you can, if you can train an AI with your, with your decades of experience and all your team's decades of experience, it will see scenarios that it's seen before and be able, be able to predict. And that, that data is there. And I think you make a really excellent point, which is, you know, being geographically close is is really valuable, but actually being close in terms of a relationship and close in terms of your alignment with data and with information is is even more valuable. You know, we can be we can be the other side of the planet, but as long as we've got the right communication tools, the lines are open, we can see clearly. Um, we'll be able to achieve the outcomes we want in and terms of. Support. You're from the EMS environment, you know. When when I talk to 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 uh, companies, I remember the day when um, uh, Flexronics took over Solectron, you know, mm. and they both were a customer of of my then <clears throat> employer. You know, it took a while just to get a, a, a transparency of the different systems because they yeah. both were really huge companies, yeah? yeah, and 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 it took for, and I think this is. We won't have that in the future. I think it will be easy to exchange data if it's through API, EDI, whatever it is. Yeah, uh, uh, there might be new protocols that even might be easier to process data. So the world gets definitely smarter. Yeah, yeah. At least on the, at least on the machine learning side. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. We we can probably argue about the human side. Yeah. <laughs> we always get yeah, smarter that's a- or not. If you look at that's the- another debate. That's another yeah. debate, isn't it? But I, you know, if you look back and you think, and you mentioned the uh, Selectron Flextronics merger, but if you look back around that time at um, 2000 and the dot com bubble bursting, the inventory overhang there was insane. And that was because nobody had any data, nobody knew how much stock they'd got. They'd bought and they'd bought and they'd bought just in case. And I was, was I was brilliant. in I was in Silicon Valley. There was an and, and it was a public event, so I probably can talk about it. It was a public event from Cisco. And Cisco back then started having campuses with new startups that they invested mm. in and, and the, the the supply chain. Um uh, it was a C level guy. Uh, um and he said, you know, we had five billion in inventory that we had to write off. And the problem was. When we went in production, yeah, there are probably hundreds of companies died because we were not able as Cisco to provide the infrastructure because they all were internet companies. And back then it was simply Cisco who had the main infrastructure to provide to these startups. So yeah. they said on one hand, it was a problem because we delayed these companies to start by three, six months, we couldn't deliver the technology. And then when they all died, we had the inventory and yeah. we had to write it off. Yeah. yeah. And I think even that in in a, in a, in a, I don't want to call it a bubble, but in a growth scenario where you have hundreds and thousands of startups trying to get access to a new technology, it's really hard to forecast. Yeah. If, if your demand goes from one quarter to the next quarter, yeah, uh, by three times or whatever, you're not getting the production capacities in place that fast. So I see also the data more long term, yeah. And you have to find a balance. And this is why I think a pure trust in time, uh, uh, um, in my moment, we won't have that in the future. Everyone will create some stock, some buffer stock, which definitely makes sense, yeah. Okay, it means 
people need a little bit more capital to finance this stock. Products might become maybe a little bit more expensive on one hand. On the other hand, I have to less to write off. Yeah. yeah. And I think that uh, uh, it's a good trade. It's a good trade. It's a good business balance, isn't it, to achieve those things? And I absolutely agree with you. It's data, 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 analytics, analytics, analytics. If we've got yeah. if we've got the information, if we've got better information, we make better decisions. Yes. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, when I look at what's happening in the supply chain now, I think it bodes well for the future and it creates something that's 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 more pragmatic and more sustainable than we've had in the last in the last decade or two. Jens, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I know we could talk all day. Um, we probably shouldn't. Um, thanks so much for your time, and I look forward to chatting again soon. Thank you. I thank you. Thanks for your time.